using vocal colour is all about making the voice sound more interesting. So as well as dynamics and using head and chest voice, there's a lot of other things that you can add to your voice to bring the right emotion to the song or just to make it sound more interesting in general. In this section we're going to be looking at Amazing Grace and I'm going to be using sections of that song and showing how you can think about starting the words, finishing the words, using breath, adding breath to phrases as well as all the other things we've already talked about. Don't forget that we don't just allow the sound to drop out of our mouths. So as well as thinking about good tone, good support and good forward projection, you need to think about how can I make this song sound more interesting. Let's look first at adding breath to a phrase. So I'm not talking about singing in a breathy tone, I'm talking about having a really good tone to start with and then adding breath to it. Let's take the second line, that saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. So something that's towards the higher end of your range maybe that you're going to use head voice for or if you're a guy it's high in terms of your full voice. So you need a good tone to start with but you're going to add breath to that and I'm going to demonstrate adding breath and then taking the breath away all along the same note. That saved a wretch like me. So there was breath to start with but then it ended in that pure heady voice. You may have often heard people talk about adding chest or adding head to a voice. This means that perhaps the note is in the middle of your range and you need to add some power to it or you need to add some of that brilliance that we were talking about when using head voice. So let's look at that first verse again and I'm going to start by singing just in a reasonable head type voice. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Okay, so now perhaps I want that to sound a little bit more powerful than that. It was, it was quite a quiet start, so I'm going to add some chest to that. sounds sort of more full and you could see how it would resonate more with the chest. Now let's look at the third line, I once was lost and I'm going to sing that quite powerfully but then show adding some head to it. I once was lost but now am found. Okay so now we want that to be a little softer but not more breathy still considering using that brilliance. I once was lost, but now am found. And again to show the more powerful one. I once was lost, but now am found. So I've added some head into that voice, the exact same notes. Let's look at one more example of going from head to chest in one note. So we're looking really at the word sun from bright shining as the sun. Bright shining as the sun. So that's achieved by really pushing on that diaphragm. It's not achieved by adding tension to the neck. Sun. You have to support that from here. Let's listen to that again. Bright shining as the sun. And now let's start off really soft and hear that crescendo and more of those chesty tones coming in. Bright shining as the sun. to consider 
is the initiation of words. So how are they going to be started? If we look at the first word, amazing, and think about how you say that, amazing. You use a glottal stop, uh, uh. Your throat actually comes together to make that sound, amazing. Now you might not want to sing it like that, you might want to use what we call a soft initiation, which involves a slight breath. So to practice that, you would need to say, amazing, amazing. And then just come back on that breath a bit, because you don't want to sing amazing grace. Amazing grace. Different to amazing grace. So I'm looking at some of the other words. I once was lost. Are you going to sing I once was lost, or are you going to sing, I once was lost? Is that going to be a breathy start or a hard start to that word? How sweet the sound. Are you really going to emphasise that? Let's just listen to that, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet. with a nice big breath in front of the her, but you might not want to put as much. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. These are all things you can decide ahead of time and if you think you're going to be nervous about it, mark your copy. That means that when you've got a copy of the words in front of you, put marks on the letters that you want to sing differently. Put a wiggly line for where you want vibrato. Put an H or a C for head or chest voice. Just to give you that confidence when you glance down at your copy, you think, yes, I remember now. That's what I was going to sing. You can also consider using what's known as vocal fry. This is a funny little sound in the back of the throat that you may have heard many singers use. Uh, it's kind of like that obviously sounds quite silly by itself, but this is how it sounds when used with a song. See if you can spot it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but overuse this unless it's really part of the style you already sing in but it does make a difference to how the whole thing sounds. Also you can consider the ending of words. Now there's hard endings like saved and there's soft endings like for the word hour which doesn't have a hard consonant at the end but you can put some breath in there sort of drop off at the end like this. The hour I first believed. So you're sort of adding breath and you're emphasising that word right at the end. You might not want to put something at the beginning of a word that you're making the most of the end of. Just choose one or the other. When using vibrato, you can add what we call a vibrato tail. This means that the sound is straight to start off with and then goes into vibrato right at the end of the note. Let's look at the last line, was blind but now I see. Was blind but now I see. So it's just adding that tiny little bit of texture. You don't want to overdo it and remember, if you're singing with other singers, make sure you know how their vibrato sounds as well so you're not clashing. What I'm going to do now is sing the last verse of Amazing Grace when we've been there 10,000 years. I'm going to sing it in a sort of flat manner. I mean using good tone and support but not really adding anything extra. And then I'm going to sing it again adding vocal colour.
add some dynamics to that, some soft starts or some drop-offs, anything that's going to make it sound a little bit more interesting. well supported nothing really too wrong with it but the second one was a lot more textured and hopefully a lot easier and a lot more pleasurable to listen to so try to remember some of those tips when you're singing and it doesn't just have to be for a solo performance this can be when you're a backing vocalist or a lead vocalist just adding some of those little colorings to your voice can make all the difference to how the song sounds Now we're going to do some broken chords. These are based on arpeggios, but they're done in a sort of sequence of triads. That's going up and now coming down. And we finish on the fifth. Let's just listen to that again. And coming down. Okay, let's try that one together. <clears throat> and the next note up. Now let's try the whole thing without breathing in between going up and coming down. So, really good breath, well supported. And the next note up. Same thing, all in one breath. exercise helps with endurance so that's breath control and agility and what we're doing is singing one two three one moving up a note one two three one another note one two three one and another note one two three one and then coming back down sort of creating like a scale but using all the notes in between this is how it goes Let's try that together. So the slower you do it, the more breath you need, and the faster you do it, the more agility you need. Let's try it just a little faster. Okay, now we'll do a few in a row. So you need to make sure in that breath moment that you get, you fill your lungs. There's not time to do a big gradual breath, but you can still fill your lungs in that moment. We'll start again on C and do a few in a row. La 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 
the same exercise, but we're going to shift it up a few notes. So let's start up here on A and sing the sound OO. Here we go. exercise done to the tune of the William Tell Overture and we're going to start off quite slowly but not too slowly because it has to be done in one breath. You can make up your own words to this. I'm choosing to sing sing a song to start off with and really you can come up with anything, a name that works or a phrase that works. The idea is to get that jaw warmed up a little bit and the tongue moving very quickly because it's quite a quick sort of staccato exercise. Sing a song, sing a song, sing a song, 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 sing a song, sing a song, sing a song, 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 sing a song, sing a song, sing a song, 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 sing a song, sing a song, song, song. Okay, so you see how it goes. Bit of a tongue twister, but let's try it together. Sing a song, sing a song, sing a song, 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 sing a song, sing a song, sing a song, 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 sing a song, sing a song, sing a song, 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 sing a song, sing a song, song, song. All in one breath, don't forget. Right, let's try another one. Let's try take a break. Take a break, take a break, take a break, 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 take a break, take a break, take a break, 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 take a break, take a break, take a break, 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 take a break, take a break, break, break. Now because the longest note is towards the end. You don't want to find yourself having run out of breath and so you're singing take a break, take a break, break, break and you've just completely run out of breath. Conserve the breath right to the end of the exercise. Let's try cup of tea. Cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea, 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 cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea, 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 cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea, 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 cup of tea, cup of tea, 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 cup of tea, tea, tea. Try that one again. Cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea, 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 cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea, 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 cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea, 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 cup of tea, cup of tea, 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 and so on. Feel free to sing it at a good point within your own range and to make up your own phrasing. Make sure it's something that is moving your jaw and making your tongue do a bit of work. Now you can run exercises together, put two together to make sure that you are using more breath control and working on that endurance, building up strength in your diaphragm and in this whole support system around here. So what I'm going to do now is sing a full scale and then sing a half scale immediately after it, like this. Ah. So that was the full scale, up and down, and then the five notes that we've sung a lot. Let's try that together. Okay, now let's try a couple in a row. We'll move up step each time. <clears throat> to develop different parts of your technique. Uh, I've not really had much formal musical training. I, I did get some violin lessons when I was in school, but I was using those to get out of geography and physics, and eventually I wasn't getting any better at the violin, so 
they, they, they kind of figured out what I was up to. But it actually gave me an understanding uh, of scales, uh, of music. I was able to play the violin, I was able to read music. Uh, so that was some formal training and uh, that's really helped me. I mean basically as a guitar player I just learn continually. I watch other people playing, I learn from them uh, and that's really it. You never stop learning so um, I'm always looking for fresh ideas. Um, in terms of vocals, uh, once several years ago when I was leading a worship team uh, our vocalists were so bad that we had to turn the mics off on a Sunday evening. So we, we got a professional voice coach in who's actually trained some pop stars and she took all of us who were singers and basically helped us to breathe right, helped us to understand how to get the best out of our voice. So um, I had some training there, so at least I know a little bit about breathing, breathing right. I had, um, had a few vocal lessons because I really believe that when God gives you um, opportunities that we should rise to the challenge as much as we can and you know invest in those gifts so I wanted to get lessons to, to sew into that and uh, I did find them helpful um, I learnt uh, quite a lot about breathing and breath control and taking much bigger breaths and I was fortunate enough to study singing at school so that was one of the instruments that I took uh, as part of my subject which was music so um, I've done a lot of that and I guess uh, I, I've worked out a way of singing that doesn't hurt my voice, so that's, I guess, the main thing. I've, I've gone through the lessons and done that, but um, for me, it seems like the songs, um, learning to sing a song is a bit like the high jump. I mean, it's almost like you, your muscles have memory, and uh, the more I sing a song in a particular key, um, the more comfortable my, my voice is with that, and the less strain on it um, there appears to be, and also the more in tune and more pitch perfect, not pitch perfect, but at least um, more in tune I can sing. So um, even if I can sing a song in the key of B major, if I move it up to C major, my muscles are going to go, huh, that's interesting, I haven't sung that before, and I'll, I'll struggle a little bit. So uh, I think it was Johnny Cash, he was asked, um, how do you make a song your own? He used to sing songs that other people wrote. He said, I'd sing the song a hundred times, and by the time I finish that, I'm comfortable with the song, I feel like it's my own, and I can sing it. And I guess there's an element of truth in that for me. The more I sing the song at home or, you know, the more I sing it in church, the more comfortable I am with that. And that's how I, I kind of get my voice ready for leading worship. What we're going to do now is listen to Deborah singing Amazing Grace all the way through. And what I'd like you to do is to get a pen and paper and to try and write down where you hear certain effects she's using in her voice. So look out for vibrato, look out for head and chest voice, look out for how she's starting the lines, is she using soft initiation or is she using a glottal stop and try to write those things down as you hear them. Then afterwards we'll go over it together.
Did you notice that nice forward tone that Deborah was using all the way through that song? It was really good. Now let's have a look at what she did in terms of what techniques she used and let's see if you wrote down the kind of things I'm going to say. So the first verse, she started off fairly confidently but not too loud and she added a little bit of vibrato on the longer words right at the beginning, amazing and grace and then on sound as well. Now she made the most of that word saved, that saved a wretch. You don't have to do that. Your other option, of course, is to just sing that very softly, saved a wretch. But she kind of took a breath after that, made the most of that D. Then she went on to use head voice with vibrato on the me and continued in her head voice and again made the most of blind, but now I see. And she used a vibrato tail on C, so C was sung straight to begin with and then went into vibrato as an effect. So verse 2 started off louder and she kept that dynamic up, used some vibrato on heart and then went into head voice for relieved with vibrato. She stayed in head voice, continued how precious did that grace appear and then decrescendo towards the end and stayed soft for the hour I first believed, dropping off on hour. The hour I first. So it just brings a little bit of effect, a little bit of emotion. Verse three, she started in chest voice, so a good strong start and then decrescendo towards the end of the line. She moved towards head voice and added breath to "'Tis grace has brought me safe thus far and continued softly until the end. And in the last verse, started off louder than she had finished, so a dynamic increase, and she crescendoed from there as well to bright shining as the sun, but actually kept that in her chest voice. So you really need a lot of support to be able to do that kept the volume up, we've no less days to sing God's praise, and then decrescendo towards the end of that line, decrescendo again on the fourth line, and then added a vibrato tail to begun. So begun was sung straight, and then a vibrato tail to end. Now when you're singing that song, what goes through your head? How do you approach singing a song with a relatively big range like that? Well, the beginning of the song is actually quite an easy range for me. Um, it's quite low down in my chest voice. But um, as I approach the second half of the song, um, where you need a lot more power, and especially that um, I'm used to singing in more of a rock band, and so I actually need to um, get a lot more volume and um, a lot more power to cut through the sound of the band. So I actually um, tense my abdominal muscles on the particular notes that are very, very high, um, and that way I seem to uh, get much more power and more depth. Um, into my voice. Mm. So you're using support from the diaphragm to help you reach those higher notes in your chest voice. Yeah, it just I seem to be able to get a, a much better handle on it, and um, mm. rather than sort of trying to sort of sing above it, I try and sort of sing almost underneath it. Yeah, great. So have you had to train yourself to do that, or did that just come naturally to you? No, I've definitely had to um, train my chest voice to go much higher than it would normally go. And like I said, it was because. Um, of uh, singing in that style of music. Mm. Great, thank you. So Deborah, when you lead, you play guitar at the same time, don't you? Yes. And how does that affect your singing? Because we've talked a lot about posture and standing straight and having room for good breathing. If you've got a guitar right there, how do you work that through? 
Well, obviously, posture is very important um, because of the extra weight with the guitar. So you have to hold, um, first of all, your back strong and um, unlock your knees, make sure you've got a good um, stance there. And um, with regards to uh, singing long passages where you need um, a lot of breath, I actually hold my guitar slightly to the side, so it's just resting against my stomach and um, on the side of my stomach more. And then that way I can uh, get enough breath and still carry on playing the guitar. So do you have to actually hold the guitar out? You say you can still lean it, but you lean it on the side. Yeah, just where, um, just where the, uh, your belly sort of goes to the side, I just hold it right there and, um, and just, just a slight movement, but it just gives me that flexibility. And what about in terms of reaching forward for the microphone? Do you find that your chin's going out and your neck is getting tense, or how do you cope with that? Um, I actually make sure that before I um, start singing, I um, make sure the microphone is actually slightly lower than I think it's going to be so that I um, keep my legs uh, wider apart so that I've got a better stance and um, make sure that the microphone's at a 90 degree angle and sometimes even if I want to close my eyes I'll actually um, just press my lips slightly against the microphone so I know where it is. Great, thank you. Everyone has their own way of choosing songs. Now when I'm leading worship I like to consider a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to start off with songs about God. Now you might think that sounds really obvious, but it's very easy to find a lot of songs about what I'm going to do, about what we're going to do, about my intentions, and although they're sort of about God, they're not really declaring the characteristics of God and who he is. So I like to start there, let's declare who God is, let's think about what he's like, his character, his attributes, because those things never change. And it doesn't matter what kind of state I'm in, God never changes. He is always faithful, he is always loving, he is always true. And declaring those things together as a congregation is very powerful. It's a statement that only us as Christians can make. Now from there you may want to move to songs of intention. In response to who you are God, I am now going to say this or do this. So songs about what we might do as God's people or what I might do as a person who has a relationship with God. But it's always out of that context of remembering that we worship God for who he is, not necessarily for what he's done, although that often comes into our times of worship. We also need to recognise that our bodies and souls might need a bit of encouragement. Now there's lots about this in scripture, particularly in the Psalms. For instance, Psalm 103 says, Come on soul, worship God. You've got to tell yourself sometimes to get into that frame of mind. And so often a song about that is a really good choice without saying from the mic, come on everybody, let's praise the Lord, let's get our souls in line with what God is doing. We can just sing a song about it or perhaps read a psalm. Now I also like to think about keys in choosing songs and I'm renowned for uh, choosing songs that are all in the same key or if not, we just sing them all in the same key and the bands that play with me know that they have to be versatile. Now you don't need extreme versatility, but you can choose songs that are in similar keys that run together well. So you haven't got loads of gaps and restarting and looking around and page turning, that you can make that flow a little bit easier. So I always consider that as well. And when I'm preparing my choice of songs, I think, do they run together well in terms of key, in terms of musically and tempo? Will that be an odd stop and start, or will we be able to keep the flow of the worship going? So to summarise, I think theme is definitely more important. You have to consider where is God leading your community if you're responsible for choosing the songs. Key is a consideration, but a secondary consideration really. You don't just want to get your favourite songbook, pick all the songs in G and think, well that's going to flow very nicely. It's very important to consider the journey that you are all on as a community and as a congregation and choose your theme accordingly. So choosing a set list is essentially just 
listening to God and, and, and knowing what your what your limitations are. If if playing a, a Ron Canoli song is uh, is not within your means as far as pulling it off excellently, maybe you shouldn't do it. And, and if if you've done Here I Am to Worship every Sunday for the last five five months, maybe it's it's cool to change it up. All those things play into it. Where where's the heart of the church at, at that moment? What's the what's the pastor talking about? Figure that out and and. It's always great when um, when a worship set can kind of serve the sermon and complement it. Um, and I know that pastors appreciate that. Our part in the service is song leaders. It's just a part of the service. It's not the best part. It's often the first part, but it's not um, any more important than any of the other parts. And, um, and we're part of this body of Christ that is uh, that is many many parts serving serving one body, and we need to keep that in mind. And, and whatever is good for the body is good for the, the set list, I guess. Set lists, I think, are quite mysterious, and um, the best way that I've found to describe it is like going on a journey, and uh, I really believe that it's uh, it's a journey of intimacy with God when we set time aside to worship. So, if you imagine sitting down with a good friend for coffee, uh, when you first sit down with them, it's pretty much, you know, you start with a small talk, you probably talk about generalities, but by the time you've been sitting there for an hour, you're already talking about the deep things of the heart, and you've entered that place of intimacy. I think for me worship is like that. When people come in on a Sunday morning, often they're not ready to just pour out their hearts to the Lord. They're not in that intimate place maybe quite yet. Um, and it takes a while to warm, you know, warm us up into that place of just feeling vulnerable before the Lord to really share our hearts. So um, the first few songs I would see as like a call to worship. So I would choose songs that are upbeat in nature just because people come in and it kind of helps everyone just really get um, get called into to worship and kind of wake up if it's early in the morning with some upbeat songs. Songs that declare who God is, what he's done, and the universal truths of the gospel. Because uh, it doesn't matter how you feel or um, what situation you're in, you can still join in and enter in that first phase of worship, which I would see as calling people to worship and entering into a praise of the character of God. And then after that, I would choose songs that are more about uh, intimacy with God or our response to him or asking him for things uh, as people are kind of um, walk down that road it's like we we kind of let our guard down and we relax and we enter into the presence of God and in that place then we can we can do more of like the intimate um, exchange of lyrics and, um, and emotions and then often at the end of the set I'll try and choose a song that's outward focused so that um, we leave the place of sung worship really committing to go out and uh, and live lives of worship. So maybe songs that are about uh, mission or uh, reaching out to other people with the love of God so that we, we leave on that kind of note. So what do you do when you have to sing but you've got a cold? Oftentimes when you do have a cold you get a sore throat. Sore throats need to be soothed essentially. Now I would highly recommend honey and lemon. That is a fusion that works very well. It does essentially two things. The acidity of the lemon cuts whatever phlegm is in the throat and then the honey gives it a soothing effect. So if you've got a raspy throat the honey will soothe it. Now here's an addition. I recommend that you get a clove of garlic or two if you can handle it and crush that clove of garlic in there with the honey and the lemon. The honey should cover the taste of the garlic but it would really help with the whole system, the soothing process in particular. Often when we rehearse, we rehearse in exactly the same way that we'll be performing or leading the congregation, so often everybody faces forward. But have you thought about actually turning around when you're rehearsing, so perhaps you're in a circle, or just maybe the lead singer is actually facing the band so that you can learn to read each other's body language and communication skills and the way that you interpret songs. This really does help when you come to performing. Now the flip side of that is obviously if you're now not facing your musicians, they can't read all of your facial expressions, so you will need to communicate to them at some points. But really when trying to learn a song, that's the best way of getting it right uh, more quickly and everybody understanding what the song's about, their parts and when to come in and when to stop. If you as a singer have any kind of responsibility in maybe the leadership of your meeting or how your songs are chosen, it's a great idea to just introduce a really simple checklist to make sure you've got everything 
So all the bits and pieces happen, perhaps when you introduce a new song or when you're doing songs that uh, maybe people are unfamiliar with. So just make sure things like the visuals are there. Uh, you've communicated and liaised with the people uh, doing the words for perhaps an overhead projector or something like that. Uh, make sure the band have the chords. Make sure the sound man knows of any changes and perhaps even your set list. So just put together something for everybody who's critically involved in the, uh, the, the service and the way the service is run. Um, just knows what you're doing when so that there are no nasty surprises when it comes to actually doing the service and leading the congregation. When it comes to sound checks, how often have you been in the situation where perhaps you're sound checking with a PA system and you get a wedge or a monitor, so in other words, a speaker, maybe somewhere near you, or your feet, and the sound man asks you what you want in a monitor. And a lot of people say, well, just a little bit of everything so I can hear everything. But actually, you only want the bits and pieces in your monitor that just help your vocal performance. So what you really need is something that helps you to identify the rhythm, something that helps you to identify the lead, and something that helps you to identify the harmony. So for your rhythm, think about what's making the rhythm in your band. If you have a drummer, it's probably best to look at the hi-hats, which is the, the, the flat symbol often on the left of the drummer if they're playing in a standard right-handed format. So the hi-hat is the, is the one that, that just gives the very um, accentuated small bits of the timing. And perhaps the kick drum, the one on the floor. Now the kick drum often emphasises the first beat of the bar. And if you're a singer that finds it difficult to emphasise the first beat of the bar and understand where that is, it's really important to hear some kick drum. If you haven't got a drummer, then somebody else in your band should be creating a sense of rhythm. It might be the acoustic guitar just playing a groove or a strumming pattern. It might be the keyboard, it might be the bass player, it might be something else completely different. But something should be giving a sense of rhythm, and whatever that is, you need to hear that in your wedge. You also need to hear, very importantly, what's creating the lead. So if it's you, have you got enough of your vocal? If you're a vocalist operating without uh, an instrument, perhaps you want to adopt one of your musicians almost as like as a musical director, as your lead instrument to help you and work really closely with you. So you obviously need to hear most of them. If it's guitar-led worship, often people just like to hear uh, the, the, the acoustic guitar as the instrument that covers most of the basses. Also think about what's making the harmony so you can blend effectively with the other harmonies going in the band. When teaching a new song, I think it's really important to be very clear about what the tune is. So to start with, everybody that's singing should have learnt the same tune. Now, learning a song from a CD is okay, but sometimes people can pick up on different ways that it's sung and end up singing something different. So it's important that all your singers are singing the same melody all the way through. Now when I'm teaching a song to a congregation, I prefer all the singers to sing the melody, the tune, all the way through for the first few times. So to avoid singing any harmonies which might bring confusion. It may seem perfectly clear to you which is the melody and which is the harmony, but that's not always clear to everybody. And you don't want people to be singing the wrong tune or singing the wrong note and having learnt the song wrong at the end of the day. After you've sung the song through a few times with just using the melody, then obviously feel free to add harmonies and sing it how you would normally sing it once everybody's clear how it goes. I try to teach new songs in the least obvious way I can. So, uh, I, if depending on the context, if I'm in a church environment, I seldom will I go, hey, this is a new song. Because at that point, people tend to disengage from worship and put on their thinking heads. Um, I know I've raised a whole lot of theological issues by saying that, but basically people disengage from worship at that point. So I try not to say that. What I'll tend to do is I'll, I'll introduce a new song at about three or four in the, in the set list. So it'll be the third song, the fourth song. Seldom, never will it be the first song because that's the moment when you want to draw people in and a new song is just another barrier to worship. So um, I tend to introduce new songs later on in the set. Um, I introduce them next to songs that sound a little bit like them, at least rhythmically or in, in a similar key. 
and, uh, and thematically, so that it's not a big adjustment. If we're in the middle of worship and we, we start a new song that's centered around a similar theme or verse in the Bible, it's not going to be a big stretch for them. I try to introduce new songs as unobtrusively as possible. I'm really intentional about teaching new songs because I want to make sure that people aren't, um, aren't missing it. I think uh, you have to be really careful not to incorporate too many at the same time, obviously. Uh, I've been at worship services where I haven't known one song. And I don't think that should ever be the case. Even if uh, you're playing in front of a really familiar group that meets every, every week, there's always people that are coming in that have different experiences than the vast majority. I think it's even if it's just one song, one familiar hymn or chorus, we always try to incorporate that. And, and for us, um, we have our own songs which we try to incorporate, which, which enter a new challenge because a lot of times nobody's heard of them, so we try to make sure that it's only two or three in a service, um, especially when we're, um, we're there to lead worship for people that people are going to know. It's important, I think, also to teach the chorus. It's not hard to do. It takes 30 seconds at the top of the song, but it just it does wonders to kind of just make people feel comfortable with the song. They can feel like they own it if they've even just heard it once and had you kind of walk them through it. So make sure that you're um, just intentional and and that you keep again the body of Christ in mind when you're when you're trying to teach them all the cool new songs that you've written.